All right, the title of the sermon this morning is The Truth About Satan. The Truth About Satan. Now, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2, in verse 9, For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgave also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. So this is talking about conflict within the local church, right? And us telling them, hey, to obey obviously what Paul has commanded them, but also to love one another by forgiving each other. If they've wronged anyone, that we forgive one another and make sure that the relationships within church are good. And look at what he says here. He warns here in verse 11, 2 Corinthians 2.11. He says, lest, right, in the case, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Not ignorant of his devices. What's he saying? You're not ignorant or you have no clue or no idea about how Satan works. Now, even though the Bible has a lot to say about Satan, and, and you know, if I was to really go into depth on every verse that touches on Satan, there's so much in the Bible about Satan. We really have no excuse to be ignorant about how Satan goes about things and, and what he's capable of and who he is and, and what, why he's there. But unfortunately, there's so many misconceptions about Satan, and uh, this is what I want to sort of address in these sermons. So I want to preach this week and possibly and probably next week as well because I'm not going to cover everything. But this week and next week, we're going to go in depth and talk about Satan. We're going to learn a lot and hopefully some misconceptions that you may have about Satan will be covered as I go through a lot of this uh, Bible material. Because unfortunately, not everyone reads and studies their Bible the way that they should. You know, So you don't want church to be the only time you're getting a dose of Bible during the week. You need to be reading your Bible throughout the week. You know, you think of the Bible as your spiritual food. I mean, do you only eat once a week? No, you eat every day, multiple times a day. That's why Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. If you're wondering why you're not growing, well, maybe you're not getting enough nutrition. You know, if you're not a strong Christian, usually it's because you're not doing enough work, right? Preaching the gospel. But if you're not growing as a Christian, it's probably because you're not eating enough. Right? You're not eating enough of the meat of the Word of God and getting enough milk and meat and food because um, you're not going to live by bread alone. You're going to live by every Word of God. So this week and next week, we're going to talk about Satan, right? Now, the first point I want to talk about is where did Satan come from? Where did Satan come from? This is why we start in Ezekiel 28. There's, there are some passages in the Old Testament where we get a lot of insight into Satan and Ezekiel 28 is one of them. Now, what you have to understand about the Old Testament, Old Testament has a lot of dark sayings, right? This is why, you know, when Jesus came, the apostles, they weren't really sure, like, you know, Jesus was going to set up his kingdom. You notice that when Jesus came, they're saying, like, when are you going to set up the kingdom? And after he rose again from the dead, remember, he went to heaven, he's like, you know, is now the kingdom going to happen? Because in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is a bit dark in the sense that it's not always easy to understand because there are prophecies in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's referring to things that are actually happening at the time. So Ezekiel in Ezekiel 28 is actually preaching against a king of Tyrus. But at the same time, he's prophetically talking about Satan. And how do we know that? Well, you can see in the passage there that uh, you know, there's a lot of things that the king of Tyrus wouldn't have been able to do. But just keep that in mind when you read the Old Testament. And this is why you have to be very careful when people, um, you know, if the basis of a doctrine is only found in the Old Testament, because the Old Testament has, you know, pictures of things that are revealed more clearly in the New Testament, especially when it comes to salvation. So a lot of people that try and push a work salvation, I sort of mentioned this before, they will go to passages in the Old Testament, because the Old Testament does contain preaching on the Old Covenant, the covenant that is not able to be kept but is teaching that you need to obey God in order to be blessed and not be killed, right? Which is, that's the old covenant. But the new covenant of grace is that we believe on Jesus Christ and we get the righteousness through faith, not the righteousness through the law. So it's the same here. When you're saying, you know, well, he's preaching against Tyre. Is he talking about Satan? Is he talking about Tyre? Well, it's a bit of both, right? That's why. There's a, there's a prophecy against Tyrus, but at the same time, it's likening this king of Tyrus 
you know, king, uh, 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 a wicked king to Satan, who is obviously the god or the prince of, of this world. So let's just go through this passage quickly and we'll point out a few things about Satan here in Ezekiel 28. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the sea. So you see how Satan is often thought that he wanted to replace God. But you'll notice that he, I mean, he's not so silly to know that he can replace God, but he wants to be like a God. He wants to be like the Most High, like we read in Isaiah 14, and we'll go to that passage probably next week. He says, I am a God. So you see how he's not saying, I am the God. He just wants to be God. And this is why you can see, as we look at things about Satan, you can see how his influence has, inf has infiltrated the world. Right? Because how many times do people have this new age mentality that, that we are all God? You know, we're just all, and we're all, you know, we're just going up to enlightenment until we are like a God. And this is the satanic teaching, which is he wants to be like a God, as opposed to acknowledging that there is a God, that the, the, the Lord, that we worship and we are under this God. We are not equal with God or with this force of the universe. So here we see Satan in his pride, wanting to be like God. He says, yet thou art a man and not God. So you say, hey, well, is Satan a man? No, because now it's going back to the king of Tyrus, right? So you see how it's like you can see some attributes of the king of Tyrus that would be applied to Satan as well, but yet it's going back and forth in Ezekiel 28. And not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Though, though, even though you want to be a God, you're not God, right? You're, you are a created being. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. You know, some Christians get this frame of mind, you know, they, they, maybe they watch The Exorcist too many times and they think Christians are out there, you know, just going out there, taking Satan on and everything. You know, Satan is not as silly as you think. You know, he's not really somebody you want to mess with. And this is why Satan is very, very wise. You know, oftentimes, you know, people that, you know, deal in the occult and, you know, probably have made packs with Satan and whatnot, they have a lot of wisdom, they have a lot of knowledge. And here we see Satan is a very, very smart being. He's very wise. In fact, wiser than Daniel. So this is a shout out to Daniel. Daniel being very wise and having dreams and visions and inter in interpretations in the book of Daniel. And yet Satan here is described as being even wiser than Daniel. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. So this is why, you know, oftentimes very ungodly people, you know, can, can amass a lot of riches as well. Because, you know, they can go about their wisdom and increasing just like, just like Satan has. So Satan has used his wisdom. He understands commerce. He understands business. He understands marketing. He's very wise and he's able to make a lot of money. And therefore that money has that power in order to draw people in to do Satan's bidding. But notice that, you know, God has given him wisdom. He was very wise, but then he did it to serve himself. So sometimes when you look at Satan's attributes, you think, man, do I have some characteristics of Satan that I need out of my life? You know, you may have been given talents and abilities and things like that. And are you just using those talents and abilities to make money just to serve you? You know, like Satan did. You know, Satan's just got this, got this talent and this wisdom that obviously was given to, to him by God, but yet he's used it to serve himself. He's used it to rebel against God rather than using those talents for their purpose, which was to serve and to glorify God. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic. So what's traffic? What I believe this is talking about is like business dealings, right? Because like, in another passage it talks about his merchandise. Hast thou increased... Thy riches and thy heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore I bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. So not only is Ezekiel here preaching against judgment coming on the king of Tyrus, but this is also about Satan's coming judgment. Right? So this is something that we're going to talk about next week, but just note there that a lot of people think, when they think of Satan... A lot of people think Satan is like the opposite of God. Like Christianity is like this yin and yang and Jesus Christ is like the white and then you know, the Satan is like the black. 
you know, and Satan's like this opposite of God. Like Satan's everywhere. He's just the evil, the evil God, as opposed to God being, you know, the good God, and then you have the evil God. But what you have to realize is, no, no, Satan is not this being that is ruling and reigning in hell. One day he will be sent to hell, and he will be punished. Right? He is a created being, and this is what we're going to see here. They shall bring thee down to the pit. Thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? So he's saying when you're getting judged, like people that think they're a God, they're not going to be saying that when they're burning in hell. That's basically what he's saying there. And it goes the same, not only for human beings, for angels, and also for creatures like Satan, right, cherub. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? Basically saying, you're still going to think you're a God when you are suffering and burning in hell. But thou shalt be a man and no God. In the hand of him that slayeth thee, thou, sh thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord. So, saying here, you're going to die just like the unbelievers do. So the unbelievers go to hell, Satan will be in hell as well one day. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom. And look at this, perfect in beauty. So not only is Satan very wise, he understands business, but he understands what is beautiful as well, what allures to the flesh. And this is why when you think of worldliness and you think of how the world markets things, that's how they do it. It's about obtaining riches, obtaining power, you know, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, which is here, the pride of life. Right? Perfect in beauty. He knows what man finds beautiful and he's all too quick to exploit that. Now, Christians should not. Right? The world exploits their beauty. And I'm mainly talking about you know, women. You know, men, we, we live in a day and age now where you've got to tell men right, to, be, to be modest. But women especially. Right? This is something that Satan does. Is he uses the lust of the flesh. He uses that allure of you know, showing your thighs and your butt and your, your boobs and all that sort of stuff. That's what Satan's tactic is. Now, us as Christians, we should be more like Jesus Christ. But if the way we present ourselves is more like Satan's tactics, we need to look at ourselves in the mirror and, and take a bit of a check, you know, a reality check of, hey, what should I be representing in this world? Should I be representing the, the Lord Jesus Christ? Or am I trying to do what Satan does, you know, using beauty and these worldly things and exploiting that, right? You know, using it in a way that is not meant to, right? The lust of the flesh. Thou hast been in, the, in Eden, the garden of God. So this is how we know that this is not only talking about a physical man. Why? Because the prince of Tyrus has never been in the garden of Eden. But who has been in the garden of Eden? We know Satan was in the garden of Eden, that serpent. We're going to look at that in a moment. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Look at the beauty, the jewelry here. And the gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in the day that thou wast created. So two things I want to just note in this verse. Notice here, thy tablets and thy pipes. What are these? These are musical instruments. So you see how Satan's very wise, very understands business understands market, understands the allure of the flesh, but not only that, he understands music. Right? This is why a lot of satanic influences come through music. You've got to be careful. If you're still listening to some of the things that you used to listen to in the past, and these are like Satan devil worshippers, and then they create this music, it's, it's very alluring. It's, it draws you in. But look, you know, that's why Satan understands music. And that's why there's nothing wrong with music in and of itself. It's a very powerful tool, but he understands it, and he uses that to communicate his message. This is why a lot of the Hollywood stars and the musicians, a lot of them have all this satanic stuff happening, right? Because this is Satan trying to work his messages and work his influence through that medium. He knows how that works. So thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Now notice that. See, see people have this idea, like I said, that Satan is like the opposite of God. And he's just always existed, he's evil, he's everywhere, he knows what you're thinking. But that's not true. Satan is not like God. He wants to be like God. He is a created being. He was created by God. And we'll talk about well, what was he created for. So he is a created being that was created by God, perfect, and he has rebelled against God. Right? So you need to think about this. 
Because some people talk about Satan like, oh, Satan made me do this, Satan made me do that, Satan did this, Satan tempted me to... Satan's not everywhere. Satan's not like God. Satan is not omnipresent like God is. God is everywhere. Right? God can be helping everyone, hearing everyone, knowing everyone all at the same time. But Satan cannot. Right? Satan is in one place at one time because he's not God. Now, who knows how fast he can move around, but he can't be working on one person and working on another person at the same time. Maybe his influence does, but not him personally. So that's why when Christians say things like that, or people say, oh, Satan made me do this, the question is, you know, are you sure that you're so special that Satan would personally come to you? I mean, you'd have to be like the Apostle Paul, you know, to make sure that Satan takes his time to personally come and persecute you. So am I saying that Satan has never? You know, no. But, you know, sometimes Christians think too highly of themselves. You know, like worldly, never go to, but Satan's doing this to me, Satan's doing that to me. I'm sure Satan has much more influential, important people to, to go and annoy. I mean, I would not even say every time I'm dead that it's Satan. I don't even think of myself that highly to think that Satan necessarily is going to come after me. So thou art the anointed. So he was created. He's a created being. Now what? What was he created to do? He was, thou art the anointed cherub. That cover. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So you see here, Satan is created perfect, right? To worship and to serve God like all of God's creations. But he one day sinned. So he was not created for the purpose of what we know him to be today, which is this evil God of this world, right? He was created as a heavenly creature to serve God, and, and we'll see later who, what he actually is, because we'll talk about what Satan is. So he's musical, he's wise, he was created to serve God, but he had the free will to sin. He understands business, and he's proud. All these things that God gave to him, that's what lifted his heart up to want to be like God. And we saw that he was in the Garden of Eden. So we're going to go there so we can learn a bit more about Satan. Because the more we know about Satan, we don't want to be ignorant of his devices, lest Satan should have an advantage of us. So it says here in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Right? So what is it talking about here? The same way that the serpent tricked Eve. He's worried you're going to get tricked the same way, right? By his subtlety, by his, how, he's, how he's deceptive and sneaky. Verse 4, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So how do people get tricked? Well, if we go to Genesis 3, we're going to look at this quickly. We're going to see what Satan did to trick Eve. And I've touched on this in previous weeks, but I'll touch on this again in more depth, Genesis 3. How, did, how was Eve tricked into eating of that forbidden fruit that she was told not to eat? Well, let's look at Genesis 3, 1, and we'll look at the tactic of Satan. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So notice how Satan starts off with E. He doesn't just start off by saying, God didn't say, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He says, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He asks her a question. So what is he doing here? He's starting to question God's word. And this is what Satan does. Satan gets us to question God's word. You know, he puts out all these different Bible versions around that are all corrupt because people are, where is God's word? Is that, you know, sometimes you read the Bible and people make you think, like, is that really what God's word says? I mean, think about the Catholic Church, right? The Catholic, when you talk to Catholics, they are raised with this mentality that you can't understand the Bible, right? That you need somebody to explain it to you. So it's like this, yeah, have God, do you really have God's word? Is that really what it says? Verse 2, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. Right? So she doesn't even know the name of this tree, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, 
lest she die. So we see the error of Eve here is that she did not know God's word intimately. Right? So in verse 3, not only did she not know the name of the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you see how she's just like, yeah, it's just somewhere. This is like when people know the Bible and they're just like, yeah, I know it just says it in there somewhere. And like sometimes when I'm talking to people, like I have to, sometimes like I'm trying to make a point and like I have to show them where their verse is and then explain it to them. So because sometimes people are like this, right? Sometimes people, when they have Bible knowledge, they have a knowledge of God's word, because they don't know it very well, it's very vague. Sometimes when you talk to them, you know that because they're like, yeah, I know the Bible says this somewhere, right? It's like this. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, it's somewhere there, right? God hath said ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. See, when you don't have a good idea of the Word of God, you may start adding things to the Word of God. Like Eve here, because God just said, in the day that thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. But you see how Eve is saying here, hey, you can't eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And I always wonder whether that's a reason why she was deceived, because then when she touched the fruit, she didn't die. Right? She didn't. The eyes weren't open. So then she, maybe she's thinking, oh, maybe, maybe Satan's right. Maybe God is not telling us the truth here. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. So now he's just completely denying God's word, saying the opposite of what God's word says. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. Right? So remember how Satan wants this? Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. See, see God is keeping something from you. Right? This is why he doesn't, he's keeping something from you. It's like people have this mentality sometimes with sin. They say like, you know, people have this mentality, well, if I'm a Christian, it's so boring. You know, you don't, you don't get to have any fun. But what they mean by that, yeah, okay, you don't get to fornicate. You don't get to take drugs. You don't get to get drunk and act the fool. But people that have gone down that path, they know that's, that's no fun. When you go down that path of fornication, all the heartbreak, you know what's fun? Being married to the same person for life. That's fun. That brings joy. That brings fulfillment. You know what's fun? Having a sound mind. Having some money in your pocket because you haven't spent it all on drugs and you're in the gutter. You've messed your mind up. And now they, you know, you're 40, 50 years old. You can't even think straight because you've messed yourself up with drugs and alcohol and hanging around the wrong people. Or you've ruined your life because you've hung around the wrong... You killed somebody. You committed a crime. And now... Your life is ruined. I mean, is that fun? So, the Christian life is fun. Right? The Christian life is exciting, it's fun, there's things to do, there's purpose. But people just don't live the Christian life correctly. Right? And in fact, they want to live, they wanna live you know, with the pleasures of sin for a season. And uh, they think God is holding back things from them. No, God, God has commandments for our good. Guys, the commandments are not there so that God is just wants you to be a party pooper and just not you have joy. Like He wants you to have life and life more abundantly. But what you have to realize is the life and the joy that God is giving you is real joy. It's real happiness. It's not the temporary, life-destroying you know, joy of the world. It's real. Right? So God does, He tells us these things for our own good. So never get this mentality that God is keeping things from you. Right? He's telling you these things for your own good. And if you follow his commandments, you'll understand. You have the love, the joy, the peace, all the fruit of the Spirit you know, that the Bible talks about. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to, be, desired to make one wise. So you can see there the, the lust of the flesh, you know, good for food, the lust of the eyes, pleasant to the eyes. And the tree desired to make one wise, the pride of life, uh, to know something that God is keeping from me. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband, and he did eat. Right? So how do we know that Satan? Well, in Revelation we're told that that serpent in the garden is Satan. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 2 in Revelation 20 as well. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So I know the Genesis describes him as one of the beasts of the earth, but we know now that that beast was Satan. Now, you know, Satan obviously was in the form of a serpent, and then we have the picture there today of like the, the actual creature, the serpent not having any uh, feet. You know, now we know why, because of Genesis, right? So was the serpent originally created with legs? You know, prob probably so. And uh, God changed the serpent in the Garden of Eden, and now we, when we see the serpent slithering on the ground, we're reminded of the story in Genesis. So that's where Satan came from. He was a created 
creature. So he's not everywhere. He's not omniscient. Omniscient means you know everything. Omnipresent. He's not everywhere. He's, om he's not omnipotent either. He can't do everything. There's some things he can't do. He has to answer to God for some things, but he does have some supernatural powers. Now, my point number two is, what creature is Satan? Now, a lot of people think Satan is a fallen angel. Right? Now, I don't believe Satan is a fallen angel, and I'll explain to you why. Right? Now, the Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 2, it says here, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So the Bible's saying here that sometimes when you're hospitable to somebody, you know, maybe a missionary passing through, like in these days there'd be preachers traveling through, they might put them up and, and take care of them, feed them and clothe them and, and give them somewhere to stay. And the Bible's saying here, hey, when you sometimes entertain these servants of God, you may not even realize that you are entertaining an angel, not actually a human flesh and blood man. Now, if these angels had humongous eagle-like wings, you would probably know that they were angels, right? So this is why angels look exactly like men. They do not have wings. That's why in the Bible, angels, these messengers of God, these spiritual messengers, are always in the form of men. You never see women angels. Right? And you never see baby angels either. You know, fat angels with a bow and arrow. <laughs> hey, those don't exist. Right? So angels are not like these winged creatures that like shoot and make people fall in love. Neither are they women. Right? Because some people say, like, oh, angel, angel fell from heaven, everything. Um, no, angel is a messenger of God, and they're always men. And they look like men. And you can't tell the difference between an angel and a man if you were to meet one. Now, Satan isn't. Satan is not an angel, right? Satan is a cherub. We read in Ezekiel 28, 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the fires. I notice that he was in heaven. He still is able to go to heaven back and forth. But Satan, you see, is not an angel, right? Satan is an anointed cherub. He was the anointed cherub, right? So a cherub is a heavenly creature. And what's the difference between an angel and a cherub? A cherub actually has wings. Now, if you're wondering what a cherub is, when you look at when God gave Moses the instructions to build the Ark of the Covenant, you'll notice that he built a mercy seat and he said, hey, build two golden cherubims with their wings covering the mercy seat. Exodus 25, thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. So this is the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And you think this mercy seat, I don't know if you've ever felt, like, because sometimes when, before I sort of knew about gold and silver and everything, like, I imagined that, like, you know, this Ark of the Covenant is quite big, and then this big seat on top of it. Now, if you've ever felt how heavy gold is, like, it's super heavy, right? You know, they, they, when, they, when they roll, like, those, um, that, those bars of gold into the reserve bank, and the bars of gold maybe only, like, come up this high, and yet it's on a pallet, and they have to, like, you know, pull it in, because this is how heavy gold is. So this is a mercy seat made out of pure gold. So I don't know how big this is. It's probably quite a bit smaller, you know, than you would imagine. But there's this mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, right? So this is talking about the length of the ark. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work, shalt thou make of them in the two ends. So these are the two golden creatures that they're building. So they're building the, the ark, which is like a wooden box, and then on top of the box, there's a seat, which represents where God sits. And then on either side, there are these cherubims that have two wings. And their wings cover the mercy seat. A big beaten work, so they make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and another cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. So cherub is singular, cherubims is plural, right? On the two ends thereof, and the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high. So notice that cherubims have wings, whereas angels do not. Angels are men, but Satan is a cherub, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. So I always imagine this as, you know, like this, Covering their wings on either side. But some people draw the Ark of the Covenant where their wings are like this, right? So they've got one wing, but I think both their wings should be covering the mercy seat and then they're facing one another over the mercy seat. 
And thou shalt put the mercy seat above, upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall, that I shall give thee. Right? So this is the ark of the covenant, not Noah's ark, right? which is the big boat. This is the, the wooden box which had a few things in there. And one of the things that were in there was the two tablets with the Ten Commandments. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. So this is represented God's presence, because God sits on a seat in heaven, and he's between two cherubims. From between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So this is what's interesting about Satan, because remember Satan is, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. So what I believe about Satan is that Satan was created to be one of those cherubs. Right? To be one of the cherubs that was actually covering the mercy seat of God. And you think that, people believe that is why his heart started to be getting lifted up because he was right next to God. And one day like he, decided, he thought, hey, maybe I can be like the one that's sitting on the mercy seat. Right? So that's who Satan is. He is this cherub. Right? Now in 1 Kings 6 we see also in the temple of Solomon these two cherubs. And within the oracle he made two cherubims of olive tree, each ten cubits high. So these are a lot bigger, right? because remember Solomon built the temple. Now it's like a much bigger structure, right? not the, not the uh, Ark of the Covenant that was designed to be carried around on sticks. And five cubits was the one wing of the cherub, and five cubits the other wing of the cherub. From the uttermost part of the one wing unto the uttermost part of the other were ten cubits. And the other cherub was ten cubits. Both the cherubims were of one measure and one size. The height of the one cherub was ten cubits, and so was it of the other cherub. And he set the cherubims within the inner house, and they stretched forth the wings of the cherubims, so that the wing of the one touched the other wall, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall. And their wings touched one another in the midst of the house, and he overlaid the cherubims with gold. So you see, these were not pure gold, like on the covenant, uh, on the Ark of the Covenant, pure mercy seat of gold pure cherubims of gold, these were like made of wood and then overlaid with gold. So these were like wooden structures that were uh, gold plated. So that's cherubims. And then in Revelation you might think, so, but this is where people get this idea that angels have wings because they get these creatures in heaven mixed up. They see these winged creatures in heaven and they assume that they're angels, but they're not. You have the cherubs that cover and then in Revelation you have a different creature. In the Revelation you have these, these beasts with six wings. So I'll just skip over some of these passages for sake of time. But in Revelation 4, we get to God's throne. And it says here on these four beasts, it describes the different faces that they have. And in verse 8, it says here, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So are these cherubs? No, these, these are not cherubs. In Isaiah 6, we're given the names of what these creatures are. But these are different to, again, angels, cherubs. And then in Isaiah 6, we're told that these creatures with six wings, in verse 2, are called seraphims. So the seraph. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, 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 that's where we get the hymn from, is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. So this is Isaiah seeing a vision of heaven, God sitting there. You know, I guess he'd have the cherubims on either side, but he's also seeing the seraphim, which are these six-winged creatures, calling out, saying, holy, holy, holy. And what is his response to seeing God? He says, then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hands, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sins purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. I mean, would to God that would be our response when God calls us to service. God is calling all of us. Who will I send? Who will go? But will you put your hand up and say, Then said I, here am I, send me. So Satan is a created creature. He's a cherub. He's not an angel. But some people have this idea that he is an angel. Now what else is Satan like? 
This is my last uh, area for t this morning. I'm going to cover a few things. What else is Satan like? Some attributes we can learn about Satan. Well, this passage in 2 Corinthians 11, this is one passage where people get the idea sometimes that Satan is an angel. I want you to notice exactly what it says here in 2 Corinthians 11. It's talking about false teachers, false prophets, false apostles. He says, for such are false prophets. For such meaning like this is what they're like. For such are false prophet, apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So notice that people that come and teach a false gospel, teach a false Jesus, they don't come saying that they're a false teacher, saying that they're a false prophet. You need to know by knowing God's word because they're going to transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. They're going to pretend to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And no marvel, verse 14, he says, hey, it's no surprise for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So some people misunderstand this passage and say, ah, see, Satan is like, he's like an angel of light. It's like the, the light bearer. Well, you know, he may have been the light bearer of God, but this verse is not saying that Satan is an angel. This is saying that Satan is transformed into an angel of light. So he can shape shift, right? He can change forms. But notice, he's not, if he's transforming into an angel of light, then that would mean he's not an angel, right? He's transforming into an angel. Transformed into an angel of light. And like I said, we know that he's a cherub. We know that he's not an angel. You could say, well, maybe he's an angel of darkness and he's transforming into an angel of light. That's a fair enough argument. But Satan is a cherub, not an angel. But this is where some people get the idea. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their work. So we see here, we need to be aware that Satan, you know, when sometimes when you get this picture of Satan, you think that there's this red guy in a, in a red jumpsuit and he's got a pitchfork and he's just like, ah, 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 you know. So people get this idea of Satan and they sort of make light of it, of, of what he's like. But Satan is a very dangerous and scary creature and he doesn't always appear as a dragon. Like in Revelation, we see him as a dragon, but we don't always see him as this evil, obviously malice, you know, individual. Because here we see that they understand that that's not going to gain any trust from anyone. That's not going to deceive anyone. So when Satan's influence and Satan's workers come, they come as people of righteousness. They don't come as people of unrighteousness oftentimes, the way they present themselves. And Matthew 7, the same thing is said about false prophets. Verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. So notice they don't come to you in wolves' clothing. They're not wolves in wolves' clothing. They come to you in sheep's clothing. Why? Because they're trying to come across as somebody that you should trust and, and, look, and, and look up to in the event that you don't know God's word. Right? Because when you know God's word, you're not going to get deceived by these false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Now, a few other things that we can learn about Satan is we can look at the temptation of Jesus Christ, the temptation of Jesus Christ, and see some of these attributes of Satan in this temptation. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So this is after he's baptized by John the Baptist. He's now tested for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness and he's fasting being 40 days tempted of the devil and in those days he did eat nothing and when they were ended he afterward hungered i always find that funny it's like when the 40 days were ended then afterward he was hungry i would think i'd be getting hungry like day one <laughs> you know not after 40 days then i'm getting hungry verse 3 and the devil said unto him if thou be the son of god command this stone that it be made bread so he's just tempting jesus here with the fact that he's fasting. And, uh, but what's, but what, is, what do we learn about Satan here? We learn here about Satan is that Satan denies the Son of God. He's rejecting the Son of God. And, you know, religions that reject the Son of God, they have a satanic influence, right? Where they deny Jesus as the Son of God. They deny him as the Lord God in the flesh. And this is what he's saying here. He's saying, hey, if thou be the Son of God. So notice how he's doubting Jesus' sonship, right? He's doubting his deity. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That's the verse I mentioned before. Verse 5, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, 
and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. So we see here one thing that we need to be aware of is that Satan has the power to give riches. Satan has the power to give influence. So if somebody desires these things, this is why they can fall into diverse temptations and a snare, like it says in the Bible. Because Satan, you know, somebody with that desire to just, their end goal is to be rich and powerful and famous, that's somebody that Satan can use in some influence because Satan can give them that, right? If they will fall down and worship him and here, this is what he's tempt, trying to tempt Jesus with. But Jesus answered and said to him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You see how Jesus here, I mean, Jesus is here as God in the flesh, and yet when he's tempted and tested by Satan, he's giving us the example here that he knows the word of God. Each of the three times he is tested and tempted in the temptations in Luke 4 and in and other parts of the Bible, in the other Gospels, notice here that he's always answering Satan with the word of God. Why? Because he's giving us an example. This is how we win this spiritual fight. We need to know the word of God so we're not deceived by Satan and his workers. Verse 9, And he brought him, into, brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. The last one I want to get from this in Luke 4 is Satan knows the word of God. He knows the word of God. This is why you need to know the word of God well. Because often those who are teaching false things, who are trying to trip you up, trying to deceive you into accepting another Jesus or another gospel, they will know the Bible. Right? So this is why you need to know the Bible so that you are not tripped up with you know, these satanic influences and these satanic doctrines that are you know, all too prevalent in our world. So this is what he's doing here. He show here he's able to quote scripture, but able to misapply it. And that's what we have to be aware of. Now in Revelation 2, we learn a, more, a bit more about Satan. Revelation 2, it says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, look at this, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. So Satan has a place where he rules and reigns from. You know where that is? I'm not 100% sure, but you see here that he has a seat in this world. He has authority in this world, and he rules and reigns from a location. Where that is, I'm not 100% sure. Some people think it's you know, Jerusalem, you know, where the Christ-rejecting... Um, religion of Antichrist, Judaism, is, uh, is performed. Matthew 12 says here, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto him, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every house or every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. Look at this. How shall then his kingdom stand? So he has authority in this world. 2 Corinthians 4 tells us, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Look at this. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Yes, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Right? So Satan has power in this world. We have to beware, especially you know, young people growing up. They start making a bit of money. They have career aspirations. They can get snared into living for riches and power and influence rather than living for the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 2.18. Here's another thing we need to learn about Satan and how Satan has influenced our world. Revelation 2.18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. So this is what he's praising this church for. But notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. 
because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So not only in this church did they have women preach, you know, preaching at church, teaching in church, but also these women, this woman Jezebel, right, which you know, funnily enough, you know, is she named after the same woman Jezebel, or is he just is, is God just likening this woman to Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not known this doctrine, and look at this, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. So what is he warning the church in Thyatira about? It's the false doctrine. It's the women preachers preaching this false doctrine. And then also the fornication and the adultery. And oftentimes in occultic religions and Satan worship, what do you find with Satan worship? It's a lot of fornication, you know, a lot of sex outside of marriage, adultery. And this is one of the ways Satan has influenced the world. That fornication has just become commonplace. You know, the worldliness, the immodesty, which then leads to fornication, and then you have all the problems with children out of wedlock and orphans and single moms and, and all that sort of stuff. So this is how Satan works through. He destroys lives sometimes by, you know, promoting this, you know, women leading, you know, women liberation, you know, women, hey, our body is free, then you have the slut walk, and then don't tell me how to dress, and, you know, it's not my fault if, you know, if, if I get raped and things like that. Now, am I justifying rapists? Of course not. But this whole mentality of, you know, women are just, you know, out there flaunting themselves, and then they get attacked. I mean, there needs to be some wisdom there, some sense of, hey, you know, if you don't want somebody to steal your car, then don't leave all the doors open and the key in the ignition. Somebody's going to steal it. So he says here, so we see here, this whole movement of women's liberation and you know, getting women out into the workforce and women not taking care of their children at home, this is a satanic influence. It's saying it's trying to destroy the home. It's trying to destroy the family. It's trying to get your children from you, right? And they put your children in some government-run school and the government's going to teach them to worship the government unquestioningly. Go against your parents. You know, the government schools, oh, you know, your parents are spanking you, tell us, and we'll report them to, to docs, and then we'll come, come, you know, put them in jail. That's probably what's going to happen one day, right? So this is Satan's agenda here, where he's trying to destroy the family. We need to be aware of that. We need to fight against that. We need to be aware and make sure we teach, make sure we're teaching our children, right? Not all of us necessarily has the ability to homeschool. I understand that. But make sure we teach our children. But we teach them not only knowledge, but we teach them wisdom, Right? Teach them some decency. You know, teach our girls how to dress, how to behave, not to be a floozy. Right? Because this, I see this happen so many times in life. You know, little girls that you once knew, because I mean, I've been Christian for many years now. So these little girls, they grow up in Christian homes. And then you, then you see their Facebook posts. They start becoming more and more worldly. And then before you know it, got a baby. It's like, just wish like, people like, you know, to teach their children to, you know, to not fornicate. And you know, parents, it starts when you don't want you know, your children to fornicate. We've got to teach our girls to dress modestly. Teach our girls to be respectful. Teach our sons to treat girls like their sisters with all purity. Because that's where it starts. You know, because guys are after those girls who are all loose. You know, and wear the mini skirts and pull their breasts out and everything like that. So, you know, we want to raise a decent society. But we don't have single mums and all this, you know, this, this family breakup and everything. Sometimes it starts at the very beginning where we just teach people how they ought to behave and how they ought to be, respect their own body, right? not sin against their own body and fornication. Now the last point I want to talk about is here. last one I want to talk about is, now if you remember, Satan will appear as an angel of light. 
his ministers as ministers of light. Right? He has sanctuaries, the Bible said in Ezekiel 28. So what I want you to understand here is Satan has a religion. And you might think, Victor, is it the church of Satan? That's pretty obvious. Remember, Satan doesn't just, hey, church of Satan, you know, I put on my, show you that I'm a wolf. No, he comes as a wolf in sheep's clothing. Now let me show you here in Revelation 2 what this religion is. And I hope this doesn't shock you, but the Bible is very clear what religion is Satan's religion. Revelation 2, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them, which, look at this, which say they are Jews and are not. Right? Say they are Jews, but are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Right? So Satan has a religion where he has synagogues. And these people call themselves Jews and are not. Now who does that describe? This describes your, you know, today, the religion of Judaism, which is calling themselves Jews. They have their synagogues, but the Bible says, hey, this is the synagogue of Satan. Right, they say they are Jews and I look at Revelation 3. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Why is Judaism a, a religion of, of Satan? Because remember when we looked at Satan testing the Lord Jesus Christ, he's denying the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what religion... Is there in the world that you can think of that has synagogues, that calls themselves Jews, and denies the Lord Jesus Christ? Right? That's Judaism. This is why when people today, they say, oh, you know, bless Israel, bless, you know, the, that Israel that's over there. We're not going to bless a nation that is rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what I mean? It's this physical nation. So people don't understand that this nation that is blessed in the Bible are the, are the believers Believers are the true nation of Israel, the true nation of God that are circumcised in the spirit and not in the flesh. And we'll show you here in Romans 2. Romans 2. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the whole law. This is talking about being a Jew, right? But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the circumcision Keep the righteousness of the law. Shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, fulfill the law? Judge thee who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law. Look at this. Verse 28. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. So see, it's not your physical lineage. Remember when the, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to John the Baptist and says, we have Abraham to our father. And he said, hey, God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Your physical lineage means nothing when it comes to being part of God's spiritual nation. He says, but he is a Jew. Look, he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So this is why the Bible talks about these people that are so focused on the physical circumcision. They're saying they, are, they call themselves Jews, but are not. Why? Because they are not spiritually circumcised. Right? He is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart. Now, those of us who are saved... These are the people that are circumcised spiritually. Right? The practice, the physical practice of circumcision is no more. Right? That was for you know, the physical nation of Israel, which was a picture. Right? So just because you were part of the physical nation, that didn't mean you were saved. Right? You were the people of God. You were only a people of God if you also believed on Jesus Christ. This is why the Bible says God has not forsaken his people. Because if they believe on Jesus Christ, that's, that's the remnant. That was... You know, truly uh, God's people. Colossians 2, look at this. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You see, so Satan has a religion. It's the religion of Judaism, right? And that's why he has the synagogue of Satan. They're calling themselves Jews and are not. And you know what? If they reject 
the Son, they don't have the Father either. This is why this is a satanic religion. Philippians 3, look at what Paul says here. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So sometimes there's safety in repeating the same things again so that you understand what is important in the Bible. Verse 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. I just want you to note this here, to beware of. Beware of evil. What is the concision? Right? Well, what does it mean to con concision? With, con, is with. Scission is to cut. So he's, you know, beware of dogs. They're like evil people. Beware of evil workers. But he's saying here, yeah, beware of those that call themselves Jews but are not. Right? The concision. For, because we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. So this is Paul saying, hey, look, if anyone's as Jew as they can be, you know, or as Israelite as they can be, it's him. And Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But look at this in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, right, righteousness by works, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now, we all like these ones, right? We all like, we want to know Jesus, we want to know the power of his resurrection, the victory that comes, but we don't always want to go through the suffering, do we? The fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that my, may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, I read this passage and I just see the difference between somebody that loves God and somebody that, and somebody that doesn't love God. You know, the person that loves God, you know, counts all things but Christ, that they may win Christ. But often those that don't love God, what's their attitude? Serving God is a burden. Serving God takes you away from what you want to do. Serving God stops you from achieving what you want to achieve. Serving God is grievous to you, burdensome, fulfilling the commandments of God. Whereas here, this is the attitude we want to have. We want to have Paul's attitude, that we count all things but lost for the excellency of Christ Jesus, my Lord, and press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling, if we have any chance at defeating Satan in this world. So, I'm going to end it here. I'm going to continue next week. We're going to learn more about Satan, but I hope you learned a lot today and some of the misconceptions about Satan have been um, debunked. But we're going to see next week some things Satan is capable of, right? And, and some of the things that he can do in this world. So just to finish up, 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Don't be ignorant about the way Satan goes about this world, how he influences people. And God forbid you should partake in some of those things that Satan is trying to do in this world, which we talked about in this sermon. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, thank you that you give us so much about our enemy. You know, we need to know our enemy well so we're not deceived, Lord. So I just uh, thank you, Lord, that you've given us so much information about how Satan works in this world. So we're not wondering, Lord, you know, what are the negative influences we need to keep ourselves from? So help us, Lord. Um, you know, it's not always just the knowledge that we need. We don't need to only need to be hear, a hearer of the word, but help us, Lord, to be doers of the word. 
And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.